Neom's The Line, a proposal for a colossal, gleaming city in a single building, seems like something that fell out of a science fiction movie. Of course, it's not complete yet, but a buffet of the world's most famous architects are scurrying to give form to this vision of the future sponsored by Saudi Arabian oil money. Each firm was given a certain stretch, called a module, in order to dive in and solve the inner workings of the city. The current state of the design is actually on display in Venice right now as a disparate collection of models and renderings. In a sense, the line stands as a collective representation, embraced by some at least, of the bleeding edge of urban technology and design. Megastructures are captivating, for sure. But what and who exactly drives their popularity as a catch-all solution for urban and planetary ills? The answer to this is complicated, and it could be any one of or a combination of folks on either side of the building equation. It might be influential political entities that are motivated by personal or sometimes humanitarian aspirations, architects indulging in visionary reveries, or science fiction authors exploring the depths of the human truth within futuristic realms of a fiction. But with how often that they sprout up, it feels like we're inevitably headed toward a future of living in megastructures. Whether they're in space, underwater, in a desert, or even just in a dense city, megastructures dominate visions of the future-built environment. And projects like the line promise to make at least one more of them a reality in the not-so-distant future. But why do megastructures feature so prominently in visions of the future? Is it inevitable that we're just headed that way? Or is it a figment of futurist thinking that's become a self-fulfilling prophecy? Why is the future so full of megastructures? First, I want to clarify something. All megastructures are enormous constructions, but not all enormous constructions are megastructures. We can point to a number of big buildings that are impressive engineering feats of the past and admire the mastery, but not all of these can be called megastructures. And I want to be careful with our terminology here, because the word actually has a very precise meaning that goes beyond just expressing something's scale. To technically be a megastructure, a structure must be constructed of modular units. It should be extendable, but still maintain a legible shape, and it must have a structural framework to hold those individual units, and that structural framework should outlast them. In order to be a megastructure, it must also embed all kinds of activities, an entire city or a town within a single extensible structure. So perhaps the Great Wall of China isn't technically a megastructure, but maybe like a Pueblo village in Mesa Verde, Colorado might be closer to one. The rock in this case maybe serves as the permanent structure, and then the building-like elements are more like the modules. Or maybe the Ponte Vecchio in Florence could be a close antecedent. It's a bridge with small shops built all over it. It's a marriage of infrastructure and building, and it has the framework and the modules, but I wouldn't really call it mega when it comes to its size. Megastructures are living constructions. They're not giant, static, and concrete monuments. They change over time, with some parts living longer, while others cycle quickly as people's needs change. A megastructure converts the built environment into a machine-like, but also a biological entity. They fold living, transportation, nature, and other aspects of life into a single construction. And importantly, this definition, it allows us to include in the discussion the kinds of megastructures that we might find in science fiction, like Dyson spheres or ring worlds like you find in Halo. These coexist under the same umbrella as certain designs for Earth, like Jonah Friedman's Villa Spatiale design from 1960 or Neom. In some ways, science fiction authors and architects share something here. They both have the tools for projecting theoretical structures into a potential future reality as a form of simulation. Giant terminals serve sections of the city, make public transportation more convenient. We can then use these tools to speculate and imagine what life might be like inside of one of these city buildings. It makes sense then that would be many, many more times megastructures conceived than there are built. The wonders of the future. Many exist theoretically for literary reasons or as simulations to play out various what-if scenarios. To build a megastructure requires vast amounts of resources. The justification for their construction must vastly outweigh some of the very heavy reasons not to embark on a project in the first place. So back to the original question, who is driving this race toward megastructures? Well, the list of the line's architects are pretty long and made up of firms like Morphosis, Peter Cook, UN Studio, Studio Fuxus, Euler Wu, and Adj Associates. From an outsider's perspective, this list is composed of folks with vastly different backgrounds and expertise. 
Uh, one's generous take might be that their different perspectives will round each other out by bringing together different sides of a debate. The cynic, though, might call it a list of vanity prestigious firms. But giving them the benefit of the doubt, these firms might complement one another. For instance, firms that focus on large-scale constructions and technology, like maybe Morphosis, could potentially pair nicely with a firm like Edge Associates, who draws on vernacular traditions and more human-oriented constructions. But either way, as they stand, the designs of Neom on display so far are pretty much trying to solve the same set of problems, creating a three-dimensionally traversable interiorized city. Each design seems to have a similar set of elements, hard stuff on the outside, flanking soft stuff in the middle. The outsides are more regular, with traditional floor plates and windows and things like that, while the interior might be called soft, in the sense that there are a series of suspended shapes that are either faceted or blobby, but most likely covered in vegetation. All the design seems to adhere to this formula. They revel in the fact that you have two structurally stable skyscrapers that you can suspend things in between, and then they call this zero-gravity urbanism, which obviously plays up the science fiction-y aspects of the project. Throughout the history of megastructures, they seem to bounce back and forth between architects and science fiction in order to play out their potential. For instance, the architect and visionary Paolo Soleri, who had a number of theoretical megastructure designs, also envisioned the Astoramo Orbital Arcology Project as a city as space satellite. So here he was actually trying to conceive of an urbanism within the zero gravity of space, which sounds a lot like science fiction or zero gravity urbanism. But nowhere was this marriage between science fiction and architecture co-working on the problem of megastructures more thoroughly done than during the 1960s and the 1970s, especially in Japan. Post-World War II, almost every major city in the country was damaged, and the problem of how to build or rebuild these cities was a real problem to solve. The power of harnessing the scale of cooperation as demonstrated through the war effort seemed like a realizable dream. Almost the entire population of 230,000 people was engaged in the manufacture of arms, munitions, and other war products. The inherent issues of cost, environmental impact, and social displacement, all issues inherent with megastructures, just weren't that pressing of concerns. This is coupled with the promise that organizations like NASA were making. Both on Earth with massive constructions like the Vertical Assembly Building and giant equipment for moving rockets, and in space. And this of course coincides with the rise of science fiction as a writing and filming genre. The result was a very blurry line between architects and science fiction authors. 1960s Japan was saturated with megastructures in film and TV, and in concrete proposals for rebuilding cities like Tokyo. Some architects would write stories as a way of exploring the passage of time in one of their proposals. For instance, Arata Isazaki wrote City Demolition Inc. as a way of cautioning the impact of large-scale constructions. Or the architect who would go on to win the Pritzker Prize, Toyo Ito, in his early practice wrote about buildings that could move and have feelings. And while all of this sounds a bit outrageous, this collapses what's happening in Niam today. In fact, they asked the theoretical physicist Michio Kaku to host a series of events exploring the ideas and the design of the megastructure. You might know him from the show Ancient Aliens, but in addition to his work popularizing science, he's a serious physicist that notably received the Sir Arthur C. Clarke Award in recognition of its contributions. Not that there's a concrete connection here, but Arthur Clarke was a famous science fiction writer, of course, and an early story about megastructure he wrote was called Rendezvous with Rama, which had a cylindrical megastructure which passed through the solar system. But the nature and purpose of the starship and its creators remained enigmatic throughout the book. Rama's inner surfaces would hold cities of geometric structures that resembled buildings and are separated by streets and shallow trenches. Interestingly, in order for something to be a classic megastructure in science fiction, it often has to have long absent creators and a consequently mysterious purpose. At the very least, by the time that the story begins, the megastructure has been around for a long time, just like the one in Rendezvous with Rama. Even though that's obviously not true about the stuff that we're building today, given this intimacy between science fiction and architecture around megastructures, we can look at how they perform in sci-fi scenarios and then maybe deduce what they might be useful for today. And I think there's four main reasons that megastructures keep showing up. The first is technology. Megastructures are inherently linked to technological innovation. A number of engineering challenges must have been solved in order to achieve their construction. The portrayal of such technological marvels in science fiction provides a sense of wonder and fascination, inviting readers to envision the possibilities of future advancements and human potential. Then there's social and environmental exploration. 
Megastructures serve as catalysts for exploring social, political, and environmental issues within science fictional narratives. They often house vast populations or entire civilizations, creating unique microcosms of societies. Writers can delve into questions of governance, inequality, or the impact of rapid technological advancement on human lives. And furthermore, megastructures allow authors to tackle environmental themes, examining the challenges and the consequences of sustaining vast ecosystems within closed environments. Another is to induce a sense of scale, perspective, and the sublime. Megastructures are awe-inspiring. Their sheer size, whether in physical dimensions or conceptual implications, leaves readers contemplating the vastness of the universe and the relative insignificance of individual lives. They can invoke a sense of humility and invite introspection about our place in the cosmos. And finally, megastructures are important symbolically and metaphorically. They can embody human ambition, representing humanity's desire to conquer and reshape the universe to suit its needs. Megastructures can also symbolize power structures, social hierarchies, or even existential questions about the nature of reality. So I think these can be mapped onto the motivations of those that commission these kinds of structures. While Niam is sponsored by the Crown Prince, in other scenarios, megastructures also tend to fall outside of traditional market structures and are usually commissioned by entities like universities, expositions, municipalities, and central governments. Oftentimes they're seen as large-scale public works that are able to spur the economy, like those actually built in European cities like London. You don't need a car here, you've got the entertainment on your doorstep, you've got public transport. It's, it, the whole thing is designed as a village in the city, and it works fantastically. It feels like a sort of overgrown student community for grown-ups. And... One of Niam's architects is Londoner Peter Cook, a founder of Archigram, who explored all sorts of megastructural ideas during the 1960s and the 1970s as well. Archigram's work lives as traditional architectural drawings, accompanied by comic book stories to explore their potential in time and space by adopting popular representations and graphics of the day. The fourth issue of the comic was entirely devoted to the theme of science fiction's influence over architecture. It includes the quote, the search for radical valid images of cities goes on, leads in many directions. The space comic, universally great in the complexity, is just one such direction, can inspire and encourage the emergence of the more courageous concepts, which is exactly what Niam hopes to capitalize on. There's plenty of pressure all around to dream big, whether you're a politician, an oligarch, an architect, or a writer of fiction. It's impossible to identify the chicken and the egg with regards to megastructures. But with Niam, I think that the image of the future, as presented by science fiction, is as much or even more a driver of the equation than practicality is. Just like the film The Godfather influenced generations of gangsters to talk and act a certain way, that I cannot do. or the way that Star Trek drove the popularity of the flip phone, Beam me aboard. architects and science fiction authors influence those that are funding and developing the built environment. I guess it shouldn't come as a shock, art imitates life and vice versa, but I'm not sure that we should all be moving into megastructures just yet. In preparation for this video, I brushed up on kinematics to better understand the inner workings of megacities, and I was able to do this in the most engaging and entertaining way possible over on Brilliant in their classical mechanics course. Brilliant walked me through a series of lessons using pizza delivery on motorcycles. The lessons are so well designed they almost feel like a game. You can track the motorcycles and watch the physics unfold. It really helped sharpen my thinking around the physics of motion in the city. All this is what makes Brilliant great. It keeps me sharp while exploring the world on my own time like a personal learning coach. Obviously, continuous learning is essential for our careers and just satisfying our curiosity, staying up to date on the latest innovations and keeping mentally sharp. Brilliant makes it easy to build a daily learning habit. Its visual, hands-on approach is such an effective and engaging way to master the key concepts behind today's technology. And you can do it anywhere in all sorts of devices. I'll pick up one on my computer and pick up later in the day on my phone. Brilliant was built for busy people like us with bite-sized lessons that break down important concepts into understandable parts. And they have thousands of lessons from foundational and advanced math to AI, data science, neural networks, and more with new lessons added every month. To try everything that Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash Stuart Hicks or click on the link in the description. The first 200 of you will get 20% off of Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Enjoy. If you enjoyed this video, please consider hitting that like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Also leave a comment on your thoughts about science fiction's influence over Niam. While you're here, check out some of these other videos which come out every other Thursday. See you over there.